Welcome back, everyone. In this episode of the museum, I'm once again joined by Dr. Tim Hogue to discuss conlangs or constructed languages. I have to warn you, this might be the nerdiest conversation I have had yet, but um, in a sick way, it is entirely enjoyable. And I think you're going to enjoy it too. As always, like, share, subscribe, and comment. Um, I think this one is definitely a discussion-rich conversation, so please feel free to chime in. I'd love to hear from you. Why were you thinking about conlangs, constructed languages? Um, I mean, growing up, I was a big Tolkien nerd. So, I mean, I was into all that stuff. I went through a Quenya learning phase. Nice. Um, although, of course, uh, Sindarin is the one that's way more popular. <laughs> um maybe we should define for everybody yeah, that's, thinks that Tolkien just made Elvish. Elvish is not a thing. He made a whole family of Elvish languages. So you've got Quenya, High Elven, Sindarin, Grey Elven. Then the language they developed for the movies is Sindarin. They actually had to bring in another linguist to fill it out. Oh. Tolkien did a lot of work, uh, but it wasn't a complete language not enough for the lines they wanted to write. Um, but that stuff's always been on my radar. And it's like, right now we're experiencing a renaissance of conlanging. It's like every new show comes out and they've got to do a conlang for it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, are we, are we just following Professor Tolkien? Is that like, you know, is it to construct the world or is it to be cool? <laughs> uh, I guess, maybe, I mean, look, if you're going to, Either everyone's going to speak the common tongue, right? Whatever that is, you know, English, um, <laughs> or you know, they're going to speak Dothraki and High Valyrian. You know, did they ever? Right. Did, was Low Valyrian ever a thing? Either in the show or well, the books. It is, but to my ear, it was not that distinct. That's one of my complaints with uh, with the. Um, Game of Thrones slash Song of Ice and Fire languages is like for Tolkien, like Grey Elven and High Elven, you can tell they have a common ancestor, but they're distinct languages. Um, but Low Valyrian, which I think they have another name for it, it's like the the Valyrian of Bravos or the language of the Bravosi. Bravosi, yeah. It sounds a little different, but it's like the difference between, I don't know, Mexican and Castilian Spanish. Oh, okay. Like, yeah, they're different. They're distinct in some important ways, but it's not like the difference between Welsh and Poitou. Yeah, which well. Is kind of more what you're getting with um, High Elven and Grey Elven. So, did you ever like try and cross over into Welsh from Kenya? No, I tried crossing into Finnish, which was the wrong way to go. Because <laughs> <laughs> Grey Elven was based on Finnish, although still taking a lot of stuff from places like Welsh to make it similar to Kenya. Um, but yeah, Welsh probably would have been an easier transition since Kenya was the one I was studying, not sending. But Welsh is funky. Welsh and um, Cornish, like those. Right. Every once in a while, I kind of want to learn them, and then I back <laughs> off. <laughs> I get close, but um, I've always been fascinated by Pictish, right? So these oh, languages. Yeah. If you're listening and you're going, "What the heck are they talking about?" Um, the, you know, we're talking about these these constructed languages that are in things like Tolkien and um, Game of Thrones and. 
um, how in Tolkien's at least um, the the different dialects of Elvish are maybe is inspired the right word or is um, an homage to what's happening. What, what's the connection between Welsh and Kenya? I'm saying it right, right? Is, is it Kenya or Quenya? Um, I've always said Quenya, but I guess I'm not a hundred percent sure how Tolkien intended that QU. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a problem the QU thing. Let's go Qua because he's I don't know. You know what? It's, it's based someone on Welsh, listening. So correct there us. Be lots of Qua. Yeah, there see, be yeah exactly. Lots of Qua's. Um, correct us if you hear that. And then you know the um, High Elven uh, Sindarin is based on Finnish, and those are like structurally they're different, right? They're pretty pretty different um yeah well because finnish is not an indo-european language welsh of course is so it's weird that he chose two unrelated languages to use to construct two related languages in his mythos but homage is probably a good way to put it because i think at the end of the day all the elvish languages are indo-european as well like Arda or Middle Earth is supposed to be like it's a fantasy world, but it's also a mythology for England. So you're supposed to imagine like, yeah, this this could kind of exist in our like ancient Europe. So like an ancient European could come up with a story along these lines, sort of mm-hmm. thing. Um, so I think maybe homage is a better way of describing something like Sindarin and that it's like it's definitely taking its sounds from Finnish the way it puts its words together I don't know if the grammar as much it's Finnish grammar is like woof. <laughs> they have <laughs> they've lost count of how many cases there are oh man declining nouns um, I mean, it's the kind of language where it's like, oh, you have to, if you're going to a city, you have one case, but if that city had a wall in the 15th century, it's a different case and things like that. I think where I was going with this is I wanted to, I somehow want to explore Pictish at some point. And Pictish is like old mm-hmm. Scottish. And right. we um, we don't know much about it other than names, it's kind of like Amorite, right? Like we, we have an idea. We think oh, we yeah. know what it's connected to. Because of those names, maybe it's like, you know, um, old Breton or um, I don't know, you know, something, something that's uh, pre-Anglo-Saxon and um, maybe more like, like Welsh and, and Cornish and all these languages before the Gales come over and you have Scots Gale, you know, that's right. this variant of what we see in Ireland and Irish Gaelic. Um, so, I've always been fascinated by, you know, what did the Picts speak? How would they have sounded, you know, apart from yelling and screaming, um, how would they have sounded? (laughs) And is haggis a a Pictish word? That's, you know, something I've always wondered. And um, yeah, what do we do when we're, when we lose languages and we reconstruct them? I mean, we, I I think I had um, read somewhere back in the day when I was doing my own. So look, I like Tolkien, but my Tolkien mm-hmm. story is this. Um, I was in junior high and I was reading Fellowship of the Ring. <laughs> I read the, you know, got the Hobbit years before. And I'm like, okay, right. I'm ready. I'm going to do this. This is, this is cool. Like I had my dad's old books, right? So like, these are uh-huh. books that my dad had a long time ago. And they had the old book smell, you know, from whenever they were bought in the sixties or whatever. And, um, you know, so I, I'm in the midst of fellowship of the ring and I, I get to the, the part where it's Gandalf in the Balrog. And, um, I, I had to read it a couple of times ago. Did I read that right? And I threw the book and I didn't read it for like another seven years. <laughs> I got so pissed off. <laughs> this is not, this is I, no, no. <laughs> and, uh, you know, cause I, I was a young lad when right. uh, I was introduced to the Hobbit. And, um, so look, this stuff's been out for a long time. I'm, you can probably figure what out what I'm talking about, but you won't, if you haven't read them yet and you should read them, read the books. If you've seen the movies, you know, you've got a good wink, you know, the movies are good. There's some, um, you know, there's some order differences and swapping right. of things here and there. And you never get to meet poor Tom Bombadil, but 
it's okay. <laughs> um, so anyway, read read the the texts, and so I all that to say, I I, I love Tolkien, um, but my first conlang was Klingon, right? Klingon Hol. Klingon Hol. Klingon Hol to judge. Ah. Right, like so, people are gonna know I'm yeah. like okay. <laughs> okay, we are unsubscribing immediately once they found out that I've studied Klingon. Run away, delete <laughs> you know, podcast. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I Klingon was a, a great experience for me, and I was a, um, you know, uh, Next Generation came out when I was growing up, and so like um, mm-hmm. it finished off in high school and um, I, have, I have a lot of star trek memories you know from the early 90s and um even the movies into the mid 90s and um yeah i just i well, remember interesting. yeah i think i don't think tolkien's conlanging has ever been surpassed in terms of the detail he put in but i think klingon has got to be the most successful conlang, yes because it has yeah. such not just it's not just like culturally so significant like so impactful yeah but people like write things in it there are people who so i saw this there was a question on um reddit once and they're like does anybody speak a conlang as their first language like their parents made them speak it and this woman wrote in and she's like my native language is klingon because it's what i was taught as a baby and that's what I still talk to my dad in. And then they're like, do you like Star Trek? She goes, no. <laughs> he, he showed it to me and I hate it. But Klingon Whoa. is my native language. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah. The Eliezer Ben Yehuda of, uh, of, of, right. Kronos, of Kronos. Yeah. <laughs> that's fantastic. That's kind of, um, it, it's like you... They, she has something with her dad, but um, rejects the mythology and legacy of her right. family because that's her kind now, right? Like, um, well, yeah, it's like she says it's it's easier for her to express herself in Klingon than in English because it's her first language. Well, she just insults people when she wants to <laughs> to, right. to politely disagree. You know, there are no pleasantries, yeah. right, in Klingon. <laughs> Uh, that's that's my commander war for I don't know what his rank is now, but Klingon was a um, was an important language for me developing as a um, a linguist and a phonologist and a um, philologist. <laughs> what what do we do, mm. Tim? What do we do? <laughs> We're philologists. Um, <laughs> yeah, I call myself a philologist most of the time. <laughs> it, you know, it, it's a little more. Um, endearing right philology means you know yeah. you love you love um, the way th- things think you, you know like right um pe- the way well, that i people remember operate. my first linguistics class i took the professor is like he tells people he's a linguist and they're like how many languages do you speak and he's like that's not what we do <laughs> whereas that's a good question to ask a philologist how many languages do you speak because that is yeah. what we do like we're interested in languages, like we're interested in how they're put together, but that's not like primarily what we're after. Yeah. I found linguistics is a, it, we, we need better training in it um, mm-hmm. for, you know, the things you and I do. Um, and I've gotten some in, in the time since, um, and it's been helpful, but it's like, you know, you almost need a, um, I think it would be helpful to have like a whole emphasis or like a certificate in linguistics, you know, not forget degrees, but just like the level of the course load and training for, um, you know, philology and like your comment too. So for those of you who are listening, uh, Tim and I went to grad school together and um, we um, are a couple of the few psychopaths in the world who have studied both Hittite and Luwian. Um, Luwian, mm. you've never heard of Lu- you may have heard of Hittite because Hittites are in the Bible, but um, Luwian, you haven't uh, heard of, and that's a language of ancient uh, Syria and Southeast Turkey, and um, it's related to Hittite, it's Indo European. But Tim made a comment to someone one time when you know, like, we're sitting a- a- amidst a bunch of Indo Europeanists and they're doing Hittite, I think it was in Hittite class, 
you know, where you made the comment. Probably. And um, you, uh, oh, I forget how it came up. You know the comment I'm talking about, right? Oh, oh yes, I do remember this. Now go ahead yeah. and I, I'll, if I tell your so, joke for you, it's not even a joke. Right, like, right, right. Yeah, it's not even, it's just the, the way different fields approach language. So the Indo-Europeanists are hardcore historical linguists. So that they always have like this deep time explanation, like, well, this must have come from S4, which of course in Proto-Indo-European was this. And then if you're our Indo-European professor, you eventually get to the point where you're like, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I know the gesture I've seen. <laughs> 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 right. But um, somebody, so Hittite is a language that um, you didn't write it all the way out the way that it was pronounced. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they threw in a Sumerian word or an Akkadian word. Maybe in some cases those were loan words, but in some cases it's just that because the writing system they have came from Mesopotamia, it was easier to just write like your verb out in Akkadian and let the reader know like this should be read in Hittite, but we're not going to bother writing that. And so the, one of the Indo-Europeanists is like, well, why sometimes this is written with an A and sometimes it's written with an E and I don't understand. It's like, oh, well, in the context of pharyngeals, A, A turns to E. And he's just like, okay, I never want to learn anything about that. I'll just leave <laughs> that to you guys. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, you know, if you're listening, if you're still listening after all this, you know, like heavy dose of nerddom. Uh, like th the point is there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of background talk to, um, language study, you know, at the, at the professional level, the, you know, philologists mm -hmm. do it a certain way. And I think, um, you know, he, here, Tim's comment is crossing over into linguistics and how sounds are made in the mouth and how language is structured. Those are kind of the, um, well, phonology is, um, that's a part of linguistics. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, and it's interesting because I think that um, depending on what part of the field you're coming from, it changes how you con line. Yeah. So I think we're coming off of like currently, I would say linguists reign supreme. And that I can't remember his name, but the guy who created Klingon, Mark Okren. Um, yeah. And didn't he do some of the Game of Thrones languages too? Or he did, did he? Some of them. I, thought I don't it was know if it was young him or, there's a young guy who did some stuff for them. He might've done all of them, but I think Mark Okren's done some other ones. Um, but the Game of Thrones languages, I think you have a similar thing going on where a linguist comes in and builds the language linguistically. So like Mark Okren was like, well, it's an alien language. So I'm going to pick sounds that are very rare in human languages so you end up with like your and like all this like these weird consonant clusters and then i think it, it's an osv so object subject verb yeah. language as opposed to something like english which is subject verb object because that osv structure is the rarest thing in human languages and he just keeps going like that way um, there was a similar approach to constructing not the for the Avatar movies. Mm. That, like there need to be some sounds in here that will sound alien to the audience. They aren't necessarily as rare as the one in Klingon. So not V has adjectives. Um, like Kalt and Skaung. Um, it's like get it as Ethiopic. Uh, yeah, like get as, and it has um syllabic. R's and M's, like where the consonant makes up the entire syllable. It's oh, like the word I'm like I'm speaking not vi not vi. Yeah, sure. The per old Persian has this uh, um, vocalic R. Um, what's yeah, that? it's like stuff that exists but sounds more alien to an English speaking audience. Right. But it also had to be stuff that was pronounceable. Mm -hmm. by the actors and the way I can't remember who constructed not be, but he said like part of his goal was to make it fun yeah. for the actors to stay. So he tried to pick like sounds that are rare, but are fun to make. 
And so you go for your uh, objectives and your vocalicars. Um, but otherwise, you're just kind of thinking like, what are all my categories? Like my phonology, my morphology. And you build your language around it. Whereas I think Tolkien's approach was more philological. So he's thinking about like, how are languages related? Like what would a real world of languages look like? Not, not just having like one or two major ones as examples, but he has a whole family of elven languages. Not all of them are built. He has within those languages, multiple dialects like Quinya. He makes a, like, I, you have the Noldor dialect. There's the high, high elven dialect that I can't remember what it's called. Um, and then there's a group of high elves who live on an island and he makes a note of like, they're still speaking Quinya, but Teleri is very strange, like lots of weird vocabulary and stuff. And he, I don't think he ever like revealed much of it, but he like specifies, like they speak a, a weird version of, of Quinya or you have like the Sylvan elves for some reason speak an elvish language that's not related to any of the others. Hmm. And like, he just, he came up with these little ideas of like how things would work. Or like the, the my favorite is um, Valoran. So they're like godlike angelic beings in his mythos. Basically, they speak a constructed language that he based on Hurrian. And so the idea is that it's just so difficult. Not even the elves can learn it because Hurrian is like impossible. Even as much as we figured out of it, it's still like just as hard as it was in Tolkien's day, I think, because every sentence has like three words that you just add all of your grammatical information onto. This is another ancient Near Eastern language that another one that probably most people have never heard of. That's incredibly difficult and rare. Um, yeah, this is like um, Southeast Turkey, um, North um, Eastern Syria, Northern Iraq sort of area. Um, back in the, like, this is uh, Bronze Age stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think it had just been discovered when like Tolkien was putting his stuff together and he based one of his languages on it. And then the corrupted version of that, I believe is where you get your black speech. Ashnaz turbatuluk, Ashnaz gimbatul, Ashnaz trakataluk, ah, burzumishi krimpatul, which I always thought just sounds Assyrian. But <laughs> Pshena, Pshena Dethya. Oh, man. Uh, no, I, I like what you said about the different conlangs and like the, the background of the creator and what they're trying to accomplish. Are they trying to do something for an actor? Are they trying to do something for a series? Right. Or um, like, okay, so Klingon, Klingons existed in the original series, right? In Star right. Trek back in the 60s. But they're a little different and they evolved more in the, you know, late 70s 80s when you know they come into uh, uh the the films and then later next generation so in the films okran his training was in um algonquin languages native american languages and he mm. um he read a comment in a script that you know and he and like whomever replies in his guttural klingon and so like that gave him a clue okay it's guttural Right. Like and so the guttural means the, the throat. Right. Think of, you know, the right. gutter where all the stuff gets washed down. Right. Like that's the gutter. OK, so the yeah. your gutturals, your your throat sounds. And that's what Tim was making earlier with, um, you know, um, like I first learned to make guttural sounds through Klingon, you know, and I would not be the um, the shining Semiticist that I am without <laughs> Without first um, doing Klingon, you know, and even the first sound in Klingon, you have, um, there's an Alaskan tribe called the Tlingit, you know, and this first yeah. sound is, uh, it's not a real, it's not a K, we say Klingon um, in English, but, you know, he's taking his background in Native American languages and fronting it with the K. so Klingon. Right. Um, anyway, nerdy stuff, but back to Tolkien now, um, it really is about creating a world. And if there are dialects, that implies relationality. And if someone, right. um, if there's a different group in their midst, 
right? I mean, even black speech, it's uh, like, is that corrupted elvish? Like, is there like linguistically, I know story-wise they're the, you know, they're like fallen elves or um, corrupted elves, but. Right. So, I mean, I guess maybe goes into the, the detail that Tolkien was going to. It's supposed to be corrupted Valoran because um, Sauron's native language would have been Valoran in Tolkien's world. And then he's crafting a version that can be understood by orcs. And then they take it and further corrupt it probably using Elvish. I think he actually goes through the trouble of explaining all this so that you have like Zauron's sort of high black speech and then the lowly like orcish mm. drawing from that black speech. But even the sort of simplified Valoran is still difficult for them. So it's, it's interesting that he has this conceit of like some languages are, which is not necessarily 100% true. It's like some... Not that some languages are harder than others, but depending on what your original language is, yeah. some are going to be harder to learn than others. And so he kind of has that conceit to like, nobody speaks anything like Valoran. So everybody's going to kind of corrupt it in different ways. Because even High Elven, he treats in some cases, their vocab is a corruption of Valoran. That's a, that has a parallel in you know the real world um you right. know uh present earth instead of middle earth but like it's got a <laughs> it it's an interesting parallel too because if you think about languages that we have like um latin let's say and mm. um any language even uh classical greek right where you have a a very well defined grammatical system um a system has to happen uh artificially in a sense Right, because right. people develop speaking, they develop speaking trends, speaking habits, and the grammarian sort of gathers the way people talk and codifies it so that it can be further taught. Does everybody use, um, you know, an optative? You know, does everybody use um, an ablative instrumental in Latin, let's say, you know, or, mm -hmm. um, just to, are, are people using a different form of the accusative, right? Like, and not really thinking yeah. about it. Are they not going out of their way to think about it? I'm sure we have examples in English um, that are similar where we could use a certain preposition, but we don't, or we could use a certain verb that um, is transitive and has the context in the verb. You know, I don't know. I'm, um, but it seems like yeah. the harder languages, the ones that are codified more, the ones we use, let's say for liturgy, Right, the things that right. we use in worship, like Avestan in uh, Persian, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I, this is like it's not just ancient Persian, um, but it's liturgical Persian, and it's um, highly attuned to uh, the the sound repertoire it has. And so, right. like the the chant that you preserve is um, is coded in writing you know, with the, the nuance of sound. And a lot of languages, they don't have sound nuance. You know, we may, like our A's in English, you know, the, the British will say, they'll use a long A where Americans or North Americans, Canadians in the Amer um, United States, we use a short A, you know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, who knows how the Aussies and New Zealanders, the Kiwis do it, right? But like, there's certain um, sounds that may be more flexible, let's say when we when you speak languages and that's why people have different accents um because right. it's not it's not absolutely important information you know like we get it it's close it's in the a category it's an a class right. vowel right um is it an e an i is it e e or e you know like which one of those or a is it does it diphthong guys i you know like and does it matter, right? And so for a lot of those, uh, even our Middle Eastern languages that we do, the it doesn't seem to matter a lot when you do comparative Semitics and you can see where shifts happen in certain places. The, the core root is the same, but you know there's some variance and that creates accent. Eventually that accent creates dialect 
and dialect can further diverge into non-intelligible languages and things like that. But you know, your point about Valorant and like the the idea of a high language, um, mm-hmm. the high language has some kind of. I, I don't believe and correct me if I'm wrong. And if anyone's listening and knows better, uh, please uh, comment. Um, we don't start out with languages that are, you know, highly declinable and highly um, inflected, right? Like we that basically have different forms, you know, that your, your nouns and verbs take different, um, uh, especially nouns, different forms when speaking. <clears throat> are those things that happen, like, you know, different peoples coming together and their style goes one way, um, another style goes another, they combine them, you know, and now you have different gendered terminology, let's say, um, with your noun or your nominal system. All that to say, like, it, it ha- these higher level languages have to have some thought behind them and people telling you how to do it correctly. You know, because w- what's correct right. language? I got I got into spats with, well, they're not spats, but uh, people, you know, on different social medias at different points where like they're coming from a place where they learned a certain from a certain grammar. They learned certain rules. Mm-hmm. And like if you don't play by those rules, people get very frustrated and upset, uh, even offended. Yeah. Even like in academia, we're we're, you know, I don't know, <clears throat> we're our own thing. We're we're ugly Hollywood, right? Like <laughs> we have our own yeah. cliques. And, um it's <laughs> very true. Yeah. You know, but we're um like people will get upset about this. And the reality is. That's BS. Like humans have mouths. Mouths have different shapes and muscles. In Japan, you know, your R and L are neither. And that <clears throat> that impacts the way people's muscles develop in their mouth. And if they try to learn languages with those sounds, it takes a long time because their mouth, the actual, the, the physical properties of the mouth have to have to change. They have to develop in order to make, to articulate those sounds that are not uh, part of their, their, you know, how they live their lives or their, their daily speech. And so um, all right. this to say, like all these rules, someone has to put in place and enforce and give reason for enforcement. Usually it's religion that does it because that's, that's the heavier, um, that's the, the major component of a culture that is passed down and preserved, you know, with uh, preserved reverently or with respect. And so um, you'll have liturgical language <clears throat> less susceptible to change over time than like uh, our common speech, which changes by generation, like, or even like every couple of years. The slang that's out today is lame. Slang in the '90s was way better. In the eight, in the '60s was better, right? <laughs> like no one knows yeah. if you say "speaking jive," no one knows what you're talking about now. You know, right? But like, it's go watch airplane. Um, anyway, a point to say, like, that's a, I, I think it's a, a great observation by Professor Tolkien in creating that world and like showing that structure and the um, the I don't know if you want to call it class. What would you call it? Yeah, you have, I mean, there's always a sort of hint of class because that's why we talk about high languages, like languages that are being described usually by some sort of upper class body. Um, So you do have liturgical languages that remain preserved and then you have the national language. So I think of like English grammar Nazis. (laughs) Like the, the example I like to give is how how often do you misspell there when you're speaking? <laughs> like never, because realistically, there has like, these are three different words that convergently evolved so that now we only have one word there. And it means three very different things. And we can tell from context what we mean. That's what real grammar is. Yeah. The orthography is entirely an artificial thing on top of it. That's how things um, are spelled. Right. And like telling us like, this is how you speak English. Like it's a bit artificial in a sense, it's its own conlang. I like to say like written English is nobody's native tongue. Nice. Um, Cause we all have to be taught it in school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we, all right. speak, we all speak differently at home. Um, I mean, and something you relate to as we've like gone abroad from homeland California, 
this is how often I'll sort of say something and they're like, what? Like even in other parts of the U S right. where they have a, a different way of talking or there's a word that they don't use or a sort of quirk to like Californian English. Yeah. Or Northern Californian versus Southern Californian English. Right. I think Southern Californians have a harder time identifying Northern California dialect, but we hear Southern California people like they betray themselves (laughs) unless we're saying hell all the time. Right. I met a guy in Japan once. He's like, do you know if there's a a hotel nearby that's kind of cheap? And it's like, well, I don't know that. But I do know that you're probably from San Juan Capistrano or further south. (laughs) (laughs) That's horrible. I mean, you and I are probably more attuned to it doing this kind of stuff. But I think that's the kind of thing that somebody like Tolkien was very um, attuned to, where he's creating a world as opposed to, say, like Game of Thrones. Like there's world building there. And it, like, there's actually some really nice stuff happening. Like, um, Daenerys and the show gets better at Dothraki as mm. the seasons go on. So her initial lines are delivered very clunkily, and then it starts improving over time to where she's speaking very fluidly by the last season. Um, that was a really nice uh, choice, like to use that for that kind of story telling with the language. So it's serving that sort of purpose as opposed to like a world building thing. One of my favorite examples of a new conlang is actually uh, Belter. What's Belt? I've never you, heard of Belter. Belter. So have you read or watched The Expanse? No, I, I've seen the image of something floating in space, but I, I've never okay. watched it. I, I highly recommend it. I love it. But the guy who invented it was very attuned to issues of diglossia. So this is cases where you have two languages or two registers of a language. One is considered like higher, more prestigious than another. And, or you have, uh, so that could be two different kinds of English. It could be, you know, you're speaking Surah in a primarily Arabic speaking country um, where one just has more prestige like when you're out on the street versus i mean you go into church and then you're going into old syriac um like there's these different levels of languages and how like what happens when those start interacting so what belter is is like within the world of the expanse you have humans begin colonizing the solar system and past a certain point you end up with a lot of people who are only going out that deep into the solar system, like towards the asteroid belt that you're getting, they're taking working class jobs. They're coming from a bunch of different parts of old earth and their languages start combining into a pigeon. Hmm. And so you end up with Belter Creole, Belta. Um, And so they brought in this guy to develop it. And he's just so clever because he combined a bunch of languages But then, so things like Japanese, German, Polish, English, but then he thought about like, how would these combine and then what would be the result? And my favorite thing about it that I haven't seen any other conlangers do is sometimes they film scenes for the show in Belter. Sometimes they have characters speaking with a Belter accent. And like, by the time you get, like, you've watched enough of the show, you start to recognize like, oh, that he's Belter or she's Belter because they have the accent. Hmm. Um, whereas like, you know, the Lord of the Rings movies, like the elves speak Elvish and then they speak English with BBC pronunciation. It's like, shouldn't you guys have Elvish accents? Like Elvish is not that similar to, to BBC English. <laughs> Yeah, right. Um, yeah, absolutely. That no, I think that's taking it to the the next level and like that's probably where it needs to go. Right? Like yeah. instead of and I have the same criticism for Game of Thrones, um which I think, you know, they do they um narrative build and they character build, exp- uh, you know, look, don't watch the last season, just stop. They I don't like the 
it was, I think it was one of the best shows ever until the last season where they committed like the, I'm not, this has nothing to do with characters, but like the, the show writers seem to have committed suicide and they completely crapped all over themselves in one of the worst, um, right. you know, final seasons of all time. And it's tr- like, they should just reshoot it. Don't be, look, people will be happy with you if you reshoot it and say, sorry, here's the better version. <laughs> okay. Delete that. Just delete it. You know, like we did yeah. it with uh, Star Wars Christmas special, right? Forget about it. Right. It's like gone. just pretend it never happened and make the good one. I mean, Lucas did it with uh, the original, you know, Star Wars trilogy, and he put all the new quirky CGI in there, and like that's all you can get now, you know, unless you right. you download from the right sites um, <laughs> and get the originals, uh, but or you have the VHS. But, um, you know, Game of Thrones, I think they it's like they slapped it on and um, they made it a part of the the background rather than the world. And, um, no, no, no. you know, it was more of an accessory the way like clothing might be an accessory or, or set yeah, design. And- the language is really just there to show it off like that. We did this. And I think that's one of like con lengths are becoming kind of a cool thing. So they're not always serving a purpose um and i think as cool as like dothraki or high valyrian can be they don't necessarily add a lot in how they were constructed in my opinion yeah no i I agree and and you know just talking about constructing dothraki um the the position of the khal right Mm -hmm. is basic like the word is khan in Right, in exactly. the history of the world, right? So these, the Dothraki, roughly, you know, they have a lot of traits of the Mongols, let's say. And right. um, the Khan is the leader, you know, of the, the chief um, of the community. And Khan and Khal um, are phonetically related just by the slip of a liquid sonorant, right? Like the L to N is a normal change that happens yeah. Um, it happens in, you know, Hebrew to Aramaic, Bain and Bel, between, right? Like it's an, it's a normal function of the yeah. human mouth to make these slips. So that being the case, is Dothraki a real conlang? If it's pulling from a certain area, like if the, the, the characters are inspired by something that's legit, something that's real, and the same, <laughs> my, yeah, and the same word is um, effectively used w- with a different accent. Maybe someone pronounced, someone could theoretically pronounce Khan as Khal, right? And then you have, of course, right. your feminine ending, Khalisi, which is just your your feminine T or Tau ending, you know? Right. And so yeah. you, you add that with uh, your T becomes a Th, it becomes a S. It's a normal sibilant shift, Very normal, you know, completely right. normal. Is it a conlang? You know, um, or is it a, I mean, like, what's a con line now? Like, it's a modification versus right. something original, right? Well, and I think you get at, like, these are pretty slippery categories. Because language is always, or it always has the potential to be a little artificial. As soon as you come in and say, like, this language has certain rules, um, you're already imposing a sort of artificial structure on something that's a little more free flowing in nature. Um, And there can be good uses for that, but like it's our like written English, I would say is at this point an artificial language, nobody speaks it. Yeah. Um, It's just what we have to write in. Um, And you have more extreme versions of that. I mean, like modern standard Arabic, I mean, it, pro- I'm sure it, like it descends from real dialects, but like who speaks it that didn't have to be taught it? Mm-hmm. No, yeah. like, it's not, it's not Amia. Right. Um, it's not what you're like talking at home as a baby. Um, and there are some interesting examples where you move sort of more into conlang territory i mentioned to you leading up to this episode the example of filipino which i found out actually failed 
Um, but they made a, so the official language of the Philippines is this language called Filipino. And the government has like an act that was signed into law, I think in the eighties. Said like the grammar and core vocabulary of Filipino will be based on Tagalog, which is one of the more popular Filipino languages you encounter it a lot in the United States. Um, but it has to be enriched by other Filipino languages because there's at least 135 languages spoken in the Philippines. Um, and so the sort of idyllic vision of Filipino is that it would be a combination of these languages mm. to promote more collective understanding. Um, as of 2007, they gave a report, and they're like, and no one ever did this. Filipino is still just Manila Tagalog. <laughs> like it hasn't incorporated anything <laughs> from any other languages. So it's like, it was trying to be a conlang, um, and it wasn't. You get into a little trouble for saying it, but I would say the most successful conlang sort of imposed in that way is uh, modern Hebrew. Mm, yeah. Cause like it's vocabulary is coming from real places. Like it's yeah. grabbing from rabbinic Hebrew. Occasionally it goes back to biblical Hebrew. Um, sometimes you get Arabic thrown in for good measure. Oh yeah. Um, Neologisms Aramaic from Aramaic. Words. Yeah. Yeah. Aramaic. And then of course, like the, uh, Yiddish I mean, stuff from European languages. Yeah. yeah, Yiddish. The grammar is very. Shtetl. Yeah, it's very Indo European. Now, that said, admittedly, rabbinic Hebrew was kind of on its way there. Right. Um, probably due to like the impact of Persian. But you look at like, if you can read a rabbinic text, you can read like maybe 70% of a modern text. Mm hmm. It's very different from like you go back to what Aramaic looked like contemporary with rabbinic Hebrew and look at Aramaic today. Oh, That's yeah. what language evolution looks like. Right. Um, like you, you can't understand. There's no mutual intelligibility. Like you have to study the older, older level. Like Hebrew is this fossil that was brought back to life. But in order to do that, they had, I mean, it's like Jurassic Park. They had to mix in the frog DNA. So like, <laughs> right. let's some some Indo-Euro grammar um, on top of this like Semitic original. Yeah. And then you get, get modern Hebrew and it's very successful. And now it's continuing to evolve um, that they aren't acknowledging in their writing. But like spoken modern Hebrew is a fascinating language, like how they get from from one place to another. I remember I was buying ice cream in Israel and the guy kept saying the price. It's like, I know, what are you saying? It's going slim, slim. <laughs> and finally I'm like, oh, oh dream. Yeah, right. <laughs> like the I'm completely dropped out. It's not even that it's being pronounced like an Aleph. It's just gone now. Yeah. Um, and so then you run that SR cluster with that Indo-Euro Mm. um that in like, yeah, like french and uh, german or northern german at least northern german yeah. yeah um so yeah that's a very interesting case i mean esperanto was a interesting attempt you ever tried it is, you ever try esperanto, i looked into man? it for a little bit <laughs> i looked into it for a little bit i never got that far like I, I've always thought the concept of Esperanto is really cool, but for some reason, like nothing motivated me to do it. Right. Like I would read about it, maybe I look at a, a Esperanto book or something, but I'd never do it. <laughs> and maybe mm -hmm. it's because uh, I wasn't connected with a community. Um, and in the end, like, what do we have to share um, besides the love of, learning languages right and you know okay that's enough right. i th think but uh, something like klingon for example you know or elvish you share in like your love or you know your obsession some of us um with <laughs> you, you know the fictionalized world and then the conversations that you can have and how like you know um myths like those are just as impactful as 
you know, our ancient myths that, you know, you can learn from life, you can, or you can learn and apply it to life and it's life applicable. It's useful. It's transformative, you know, and um, I, yeah, I don't know. I uh, think Esperanto's, I just, it, it never worked for me. Well, it doesn't have that mythology, like you said. And I think that's a very important part of like language has to come with culture. Yeah. To, to motivate it. It should come with some messiness. And I think of Klingon, my favorite example of uh, Klingon, I saw this in, uh, I don't know if, if you do show notes, maybe you can link to it. There's that guy, Eric, I can't remember. He's a dialect coach and he does all these videos like analyzing scenes and movies and television and like talking about how they're speaking. And so he found what he thought was his best, like the best example of Klingon in terms of like how fluidly it was being spoken is actually in the show Frasier that like Frazier is going to his son's bar mitzvah and he like asked somebody to teach him a blessing in Hebrew and he doesn't know any Hebrew. So as a joke, the guy teaches him this blessing in Klingon and he says <laughs> it in front of the synagogue. Um, but he's like very good at like, he hits all the like, your he's doing his retroflex ball sounds. Yeah. And, like he's like very good at pronouncing Klingon and speaks it like very fluidly. Um, and like that kind of thing only works because Klingon has a bit of cultural currency. Yeah. Like as much as we treat it as something very nerdy, like right. it's entered our sort of collective consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you get, you have Kl Klingons at the Raider games, you know, like it's, right. you know, just, and it, the thing is, number one, we know Raider fans, you know, like they're coming as Mad Max before and then after Trek, uh -huh. now you've got Klingons. So people who walk around like Klingons, oh, okay, California, it's, it's more normal um, than other parts <laughs> of the United States or right. the world, maybe. But then at Raider games, you're like, okay, <laughs> you know, like you totally fit in. <laughs> That's your team, <laughs> clearly, right? There yeah. is a cultural currency to it. And um, I, I don't know, I think there's, uh, what do they call it? They, um, when it's, Maybe we're talking about language planning. Is that it? Where there's some kind of intentionality behind shaping language, where you're conlanging yeah, an existing language, um, right? For specific purposes. I mean, like that's the whole movement and like semiotics and stuff in the 20th century, and like this, you know, trying to um, reverse engineer the way people think by coding their language differently. Um, yeah. that's language planning, you know, maybe, ha I don't know, having cases, stripping away cases, um, you know, what happened, what sort of features of language change happen normally, you know, in the course of time, you know, or, you know, like sometimes it's just regional, right? Like the, the British, what's the, our form where we say had gotten, right? Like, I, I don't think that exists in England anymore. Right. Or at least it's, it's antiquated. It's, um. Oh yeah, all it's not those the ones are perfect. So it's um, I don't know. Perfect. Is it? The, yeah, Let's say it is. Whatever. Perfect. I mean, even the perfect. I think so. You have these like verbs where it's like I had written, or, like I mean, I had gotten. But there's the sort of like the ten sort of ending survived in in most cases. Um, but you have like the alternatives, like I had writ, mm. that you don't really hear people say anymore, but it did exist. But you do find like colloquial things where you, you get these sort of weird perfects. Like uh, my mom says, I slept instead of slept. Mm. Like there's no T on the end. And that's just her normal way of of saying it that's how it evolved in her dialect and she's just kept it around um but yeah you get in language planning and it's interesting to think about how they're like, trying to drive really social development by driving how people speak the um interesting example i found in japan it seems like it was planned. I want to look into the history of it. But when people talk about religion here, mm -hmm. they're like scared of it. 
it's, it's not like in a Western context where you got like people talk about religion kind of disparagingly or like that's old fashioned or that's like morally degenerate is where it's going in some parts of the West. Um, in Japan, it's more like, no, that's scary. Like we don't, we don't want anything to do with that. And I figured out it's because Japanese has no word for cult. Oh. Um, but the meaning they've been, they've just accepted for religion is what like we in English would call a, a cult, like a group that's abusive um, or manipulative in some way. Like the other day I had a friend from my church helping me at my new apartment and the landlord's like, Oh, how do you know each other? It's like, we go to the same church. And he's like, wait, what kind of church is it? Is it the one that killed that family? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Like that's the it's first just... place his mind went. <laughs> wow. What a guess. <laughs> You mean the but, Holy like Family? There's a case where, yeah. <laughs> like they're like, because we, they don't have those words and it's kind of just culturally spread. Like it t- totally shapes a, a cultural attitude. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it's with um, our writing. You know, I mean, someone has to make a decision, right? Like in America, we, um, we fixed, you're welcome, England. Um <laughs> And Canada, for that matter. Come on. British, sorry, British North America. Um, I have to respect the mm-hmm. queen, right? Um, we, <laughs> we, like our, we, we altered spelling here to reflect the way we speak, you know, so we don't have the francophonic spellings. We don't have a city centre. You know, we have a right. city centre. Right? You know, we don't go to the théâtre. We go to the theatre. Right. And so if you go to like Canada or, or England, you'll still see the, the French spelling where the R E comes first. And in America, it's E R, little things like that. Yeah. That's, you know, it, it's, someone made a decision for it to happen that way. And there was reason for it, you know, in political, sure. Um, but then, like, there have to be reasons to stay similar or separate. And I think mass mm-hmm. communication has kind of thrown a, a wrench in the system because if we didn't have mass communication, I think our Englishes would be quite different now, you know, between the U S um, or at least North America, you know, Americans and Canadians are, we're like 92 to 96% uh, same accent, you know, but right. um, you know, in, in England, you've got how, I don't know how many major accents there are, um, but then you have all these local sub varieties and you can tell where people, what town people are from, you know, or if they're northerners right. and they, they start to like wink a little Scottish at you, you know, you listen to people from Yorkshire and things like that. It's, just, you know, it's, it's right. English, it's not Scottish, but it's, it's, uh, it's different, you know? So I don't know. I mean, there's intent. I think the bottom line is there's intent behind it and who, who decides it, right? Like, and maybe conlangs are kind of like the pirate radio of, um, you know, <laughs> of language learning and, and language creation, because, you know, we're sticking it to the man who's giving us all these ways to speak and write. Um, and instead we can, you know, respond, you know, <laughs> right. Well, and you see, that's another reason why I think like Klingon is such a successful conlang because you have like, for world languages, if you get mass media, they start to slow down and freeze because you're just going to preserve stuff for a little bit longer. And then it also creates a tool that language plan. And I mean, some like language planning can maybe sound a little bit insidious, but like you have like ministries in some countries that are designed for precisely this purpose. Like there's an Academy of the French language or an Academy of the Breton language that like is intentionally like they're trying to keep the language a certain way, Mm -hmm. but then you have people are still going to speak it the way they're going to speak it. And it's not always going to go in the direction you want. Um, Klingon's interesting. even though you have Mark Orkund. Yeah. Orkund like created it. But he did allow like people to sort of come in and shape it. And it's become like it's becoming, if it isn't already a, a living language, like the community has used what Orkin created. And it's sort of continuing to evolve in nature. Whereas something like 
the Elvish languages, like there's a lot of respect for Tolkien's original. Then you have the one that was developed for the movies, but there's not really much growth outside of that. So like they saw a spike in popularity in the early 2000s. Yeah. And from what I can tell, it's kind of fallen off because it, there's no room for it to grow. So it just sort of dies. I think the there is an example that um, Okrand referred to in one of the, I don't know if it was Next Generation or one of the films, um, where someone was speaking Klingon, they delivered the line wrong. And so they went back and listened is like, oh, yeah, well, that's it, it only happens that way after a negative. So then they edited right. the grammar, right, like based yeah. on the actor's performance. And, uh, you know, now it's something mm-hmm. people, I, I don't know, um, you know, Klingonophiles, Klingophiles uh, can. Uh, yeah. 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 Kling, Klingonophile, because the, the N is part of the root. <laughs> whatever um uh, can correct me on that and you know i like can bear with me i'm I'm pulling this all out from the 90s and um mm-hmm. if it's still there it's good um you know it, it's been preserved but yeah what do you recommend people study um or do you recommend they just run run <laughs> run as fast as you can when you hear people like us talk <laughs> <laughs> for conlangs um i mean i think to me what's what's fun about conlangs is they sort of they teach you about how language actually works um sometimes they teach you about how it doesn't work depending on how well it's it's constructed but um i mean my first recommendation would just be like look for like where conlang showing up and why do you think it looks that way Mm -hmm. um because they're showing up a lot more often now um, and so like, what were, like, was their intention and in why they did that? Um, so for example, like the Halo series, a lot of people, I guess, didn't like, but it had this same Healy language in it that's supposed to be spoken by these mandibled aliens, um, with their throats set deep in their heads. So it's very guttural and monosyllabic. And it's like, I can believe like a human trying to speak a language spoken by that would end up like sounding like sort of Chinese with Ethiopic consonants, um, which is sort of the result. Um, But like, yeah, I mean, just pay or like revisit the Lord of the Rings or Star Trek and like see what's happening. Um, I don't know how much has been written on conlangs that would be interesting to read. It's more a sort of thing to, to research in the YouTube sphere yeah right there's a lot yeah. more stuff coming out here um but i mean read some sociolinguistics i'll you know, find who's uh to trudgel has a nice little intro if that kind of stuff is interesting i think draws out a lot of what's happening when people are making conlangs whether it's intentional or not like languages are messy and so even if you're creating it right. out of nothing it's still going to start evolving like almost right away. I think uh, on my end, I, re- I remember um, <laughs> some, uh, I had read some Bible translator who was upset that like the Bible had been translated into Klingon while there's still a thousand languages out there that it hadn't been translated into. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I laughed, you know, for a number of reasons. Um, but I think, a misconception is if you're interested in conlangs that you stop, right? And instead, mm-hmm. what ends up happening is you you get into polyglottery, you get into learning right. multiple languages, and you get into the love of language learning. And I think, um, you know, it it allows you to be part of all. It, you said it right, like it reveals something about the culture, but it also allows you to be part of a community. And that's why it's mm-hmm. hard to. Um, to do something like Esperanto, there's a couple thousand speakers in most countries, right? They're out there, you know, um, but, and they'll have a convention, but what are like, what show, what book, what, you know, what common storyline did we follow that we can refer back to that, you know, where the language is bound to some kind of mythos, like we don't have it. And um, if you if you end up studying a conlang or your child does, for all the parents out there and you see your kids 
getting into all these weird things. Like, don't worry. They're probably, they're just nerds. And, you know, wouldn't you rather have your kid be a nerd than, you know, into uh, some dangerous (laughs) self-harm? Like, so uh, I think in my case, I, I would say in your case, you can correct me, but I, they've been an encouragement to me in my own uh, growth and development and all the different, um, how I learn languages, right? Like they taught me how to learn so that all of a sudden you don't have to think about the difficulty of learning one language. You kind of, you, you learn how to learn. And so you learn how to um, expand and engage multiple language, maybe at the family level, right? Where Mm -hmm. um, if you're able to manipulate your mouth, let's say, and produce sounds that normally you wouldn't, it changes sort of your, um, well, I don't know, call it confidence, but if you learn a new skill, you know, you can play a different position, right, on the field. If you can, mm-hmm. if you're the strongest or the heaviest or the fastest, you know, and or you've got the most endurance, whatever, and now you mix a couple of those together, all of a sudden, hey, we can we can do something differently in the game because these things are present. Same with language learning. Um, some languages sound intimidating because they don't sound normal to our ears. And, um, you know, Semitic languages, let's say, they're just, you know, there's too many um, different things happening, right? Especially with the gutturals. And, um, Mm -hmm. but if you get used to it and it becomes normal, then it's, you, you won't project it as something so different. It'll be something accessible. So um, conlang yourself into uh into more learning, you know, and uh, let it be an inspiration to you. That's all I got. Yeah. Well, I mean, to circle back, I would end with Tolkien. Uh, I'm going to not be able to quote this precisely. He says, no language is justly studied for some other purpose. Like you're, you only first begin to learn the language when you're studying it for love. Mm. And I think like, that's the definition of philology. Like, Boom. I, I, okay. I can't end better than that. <laughs> I was just going to give you a, a cling on kapla, but you know, that's corny and um, uh, you nailed it. You hit it out of the park. So th- thank you for joining me, man. Um, but uh, we'll end on that note. Mm.